Good morning and good afternoon. This is uh, Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm here to uh, welcome you to another of the series and MPA webinars together with EBM Tools and Open Channels. So today we're really excited to have a couple of speakers who are going to be telling us some takeaway points from the 13th International Coral Reef Symposium. When we have these big meetings, a lot of us want to get there and we can't always go, and so it's terrific to be able to draw on the experience of some folks who were there, uh, and, and some of them involved in a lot of coral reef work uh, professionally. And so we're really looking forward to hearing from Bob Richmond and Paula Morin, who I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to remind you that uh, we do have a time set aside for Q&A, so I encourage you to go ahead and type your questions in using the webinar interface. There's a question box, and you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation to do that. You can just type your questions as, as they occur to you, and we'll be, be sure to send, spend some time at the end going through all of those. Uh, so now I'd like to um, introduce our speakers. We have Dr. Bob Richmond, who is a research professor and director of the University of Hawaii's Kualo Marine Laboratory. He received a PhD in biological sciences from the Department of Ecology and Evolution at SUNY in Stony Brook, and then spent two years as a postdoc fellow at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, and spent 18 years on the faculty of University of Guam Marine Laboratory, and has been a research professor at the Pacific Biosciences Research Center, University of Hawaii at Manoa since 2004. He has spent his career studying coral reef ecosystems in the Caribbean and the Pacific, including the Virgin Islands, the Grenadines, and the Galapagos, Hawaii, and Japan, and Micronesia. And he is the past president of the International Society for Reef Studies, which convened the 13th International Coral Reef Symposium. I'm also pleased to introduce Paolo Morin, who is with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program as the management liaison for Hawaii. He received his PhD from the University of Hawaii studying marine stakeholder resource co-management in coastal areas, and he has worked in the coral program as a fellowship and education coordinator, and in the coral triangle region as a regional coordinator. In his current role, he works between NOAA and Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources to monitor and manage coral reef ecosystems and support projects that include biological monitoring, support for enforcement and management, community monitoring and engagement, and watershed, watershed initiatives. So I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and <clears throat> good morning and good afternoon, depending upon where you are in the world. Um, it's a real pleasure, and I'm very grateful uh, for Paolo for setting this up and for the support in uh, kind of giving an overview. And it's particularly relevant for NOAA that NOAA really owned at least a third of the symposium. Uh, we had uh, core funding, so NOAA was a prime sponsor, thanks to Jen Koss and the folks at uh, the Coral Reef Conservation Program. Also, Eileen Sobeck uh, from Na National Marine Fisheries Service um, was a key uh, uh, person, uh, both for the opening and as the uh, senior representative from NOAA. And uh, people like Jerry Davis from the Pacific Island Regional Office were instrumental in helping set it up. So we're very grateful to NOAA for all the support, both financially and in terms of the program. About a third of the presentations were either provided by, funded by, or chaired by NOAA people. So NOAA has a lot to be um, proud of for what I hope was a good meeting. Um, if we have the first slide, please, Paolo. So by the numbers, a uh, quick rundown. This is the largest ever. So this is number 13. The first was in 1969. And uh, over the uh, in 47 years that have um, uh, passed since then, uh, this is the largest yet. Um, we had uh, over 1,500 oral presentations, over 700 posters. Uh, we had representatives from 97 nations. Um, in addition to the 88 scientific uh, sessions, we had another 45 what we called ancillary meetings where actually a lot of the action went on. Uh, everything from personal care products. I know the uh, issue of sunscreens hit the um, stage big time in terms of the effects of oxybenzone and other personal care products. Uh, there's everything from uh, cultural practitioners to community-based management. Um, this was also very uh, interesting too in terms of the Shift. My first coral reef symposium was the third at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School in 1977. Um, in those days, there were basically two types of attendees. You were either a geologist or a biologist. Um, and now what I was very pleased to see is that the community of practitioners has broadened out substantially. Um, we had, in addition to the normal um, natural scientists, the social sciences were very well represented. We had policymakers, we had managers, educators, stakeholders, uh, lawyers. So 
Um, it's very encouraging to see that as the problems have mounted when I started working on coral reefs um, over 42 years ago in 1974, um, it was a much different world and the only way moving forward uh, to go from identifying problems to focusing on solutions is with this broader representation. So the two themes for the meeting were actually the one theme with two parts was bridging science to policy and knowledge to action. And this was predicated on the fact that, as most of you know at NOAA, science to management's been going along very well. We have very good managers doing science and very good scientists doing management. But the science to policy piece seems to have been a, a major limiting factor in trying to address the overwhelming uh, challenges from uh, climate change impacts, overfishing and harvesting, uh, land-based source of pollution. So uh, the other element about the symposium that was a little bit different from normal uh, was not only broadening it out from purely a scientist meeting to uh, a bridging meeting between science and policy and knowledge to action. And the knowledge to action piece is with full respect for traditional ecological knowledge. We have quite a few um, practitioners in the uh, group as well. But also, um, as Joni Kleopas, one of the key members of the organizing committee pointed out, uh, this is the first time we've seen over 50% of the presentations and sessions were solution oriented, that we've gone beyond simply identifying the problems to focusing on the solutions. Um, so a big part of moving forward, um, in addition to the regular program, we had a leader summit that I'll be talking about at the very end. Uh, we had three presidents, uh, the president of Palau, Tommy Romengasau, the president of the Federated States of Micronesia, Peter Christian, and the president of the uh, Republic of the Marshall Islands, Hilda Heine. And President Romengasau from Palau is our keynote speaker. And again, I think um, it was great to see people embracing this concept of bringing key policymakers to the table. Um, he's the first keynote speaker I've ever seen get a standing ovation. So um, over 2,500 people uh, appreciated what he had to say about the um, positive leadership role Palau has taken. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on when Paulo talks about MPAs. Um, Palau has done some very bold things recently, setting aside 80% of their EEZ into full protection. Um, as you many, uh, many of you may know that President Obama is considering expanding the Papanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, uh, the Northwestern Hawaiians Monument, from the 50 miles now to the full 200 mile EEZ. And to put that in perspective, the people of Palau have set aside 36 square kilometers for every Palauan in the world into full protection. If in fact we do get Papanaumokuakea expanded through uh, the Antiquities Act by signature of President Obama, uh, it'll be the largest MPA in the world, at least temporarily, um, but that will equate to 0 0.005 square kilometers for Americans, so five orders of magnitude lower. So if we could go to the next slide, Paulo. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to change things up again with a focus on uh, moving from knowledge to action and uh, from the knowledge to solutions. Uh, so the last uh, two hours of the symposium, actually almost two and a half hours, we're focused on what we affectionately call the cliff notes of the symposium of trying to get a synthesis together and um, that's part of uh, what Paolo has helped put together is kind of the overview of what were the key messages coming out, what are the key questions that remain to be asked and where are the sweet spots for moving from science to policy and uh, knowledge to action. And it came into three major categories, um, global and regional scale, is uh, scale issues, um, that's where we saw things like uh, climate change impacts, ocean acidification, um, expanded disease outbreaks, and also land-based source of pollution. Um, reef recovery was a very positive uh, solution-oriented session and some of the things that uh, Paolo will be talking about. And likewise with the management, new tools that are available, uh, new abilities to move forward, um, not only in the areas of enforcement, but also uh, to be able to support compliance. So uh, next slide, Paolo. So the synthesis questions that drove the last few hours, we didn't want it to end with the last talk and the last beer and have people go home, but rather set the stage for what we need to do during the next uh, um, few weeks, next several months, next few years until the next Coral Reef Symposium, uh, which will be in the year 2020. Um, but to summarize what were the key findings, um, how do we think about these topics and what new knowledge is available? Uh, what are the key questions that still remain to be asked or the elements that need to be addressed? And what are the main takeaway points that we can use as a basis for both a roadmap and a blueprint? So next slide, please. So jumping in, um, I think all of you are pretty familiar with uh, some of the great work that Mark Aiken has been involved in uh, with the Coral Watch program. And 
Um, it is pretty dire. Both Mark Aiken and I gave a briefing to a Senate um, committee uh, about a month ago, the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Um, they were very concerned about everything they've seen about coral bleaching and the follow-up mortality. And you can see some of the data here that um, this is the most long uh, protracted and damaging uh, coral bleaching event in recorded history. Um, over 40% uh, of the reefs that have been studied within uh, the world uh, were at the alert level one or two, which is pretty serious. Um, in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Terry Hughes and his colleagues gave some uh, very uh, compelling data on what they've seen on the Great Barrier Reef where 93% um, uh, of the reefs had experienced some bleaching. And this is a concern, um, not only was it 2014 to 2015, but it looks like it's going to be extending again into the fall of 2016. And according to Mark's data and the modeling done by NOAA modelers, um, there's a very good likelihood that it might expand up into 2017. So um, this is unprecedented, uh, the amount of areas bleached, the amount of damage that was done to reefs. Um, some have recovered and some will recover, others will not. But it's changing the entire um, platform on which we're dealing with corals, not only in terms of the areas of damage, but also what it's doing to things that we can't necessarily see. And that's affecting genetic diversity at uh, within species level of certain genotypes that are surviving and others that are not, and setting up what I affectionately call the potential for the Irish potato famine effect of getting to the point where we've selected for only a few genotypes that can actually withstand these elevated temperatures um, to the detriment of any other uh, populations remaining that uh, may not be able to handle the next disease outbreak, the next cool water event, or any other stressors that haven't hit yet. Uh, next slide, please. And just to show you some of the extent here that um, there were over 28 uh, weeks uh, where temperatures were um, highly elevated. Uh, we've seen a lot of areas that have had total bleaching and as a result we're entering into a phase where we talk about alternate stable states where now once the coral cover is lost, um, filamentous algae, cyanobacteria may come in. Uh, this is where the overlap with fisheries without uh, a number of herbivores left on the reef. We can get these phase shifts that um, stay and uh, last for many years, if not permanently, if things don't turn around. So this truly is a, um, a tipping point that we're already seeing. And it's a real call to action then is to do more than simply document the demise of reefs, but look at the kinds of interventions. And hopefully Paula will talk about some of that as well. Next slide, please. Um, Terry Hughes, uh, the um, director of the uh, James Cook University Center of Excellence in Coral Studies, um, did overflights of the Great Barrier Reef, and as I mentioned, uh, only 7% of the reefs that they surveyed had not been bleached. Uh, in most of the reefs that they saw, it was at least over 50% bleaching, uh, followed by large levels of mortality as well. So um, these are very um, pressing concerns, and there's no doubt about it. Um, but it was something that was brought up from the very beginning of the Coral Reef Symposium. And as uh, I mentioned in the opening, it's very hard to look at these data uh, on a daily basis and not be overwhelmed with what's going on. Uh, but the good news was that there was also a great deal of optimism and belief that uh, there are things that can be done. Terry Hughes very eloquently stated, we're not ready to write the obituaries for corals yet. Um, so I certainly don't want to minimize the impacts that we're seeing from global and local stressors, but also not to give people this feeling of despair that things can't be done, quite the opposite. There are many good stories and success stories of coral reef recovery, of uh, communities being able to take action without having to wait for government to ask, and for opportunities to really turn things around, but the window for response, especially on climate change, is closing quickly and we really need to work together as a community of practitioners to change uh, everything from the communications that we provide to the general public and the electorate and to the decision makers that are making decisions in some cases that are not um, really good not only for reefs but for all of humanity. Next slide please. So the three summary slides um, for now in terms of climate change um, as I mentioned the longest most widespread coral bleaching event ever recorded uh, with very severe impacts in many places. Um, we've been able to understand a lot more about how mortality changes with uh, space and time. And uh, interestingly enough, that in some areas that have marginal reefs uh, affected by things like sedimentation and turbidity, 
um, some of those reefs were the ones that actually did pretty well, and that's one of my favorite phrases, um, ugly is good. Um, oftentimes with MPAs, we're looking at protecting what we would consider the most pristine or isolated, when in fact it's many of the reefs that have already survived a variety of anthropogenic disturbances that have already been selected for in a degree. Sometimes a little bit of fresh water can help in bringing temperatures down. It can also help in a little bit of turbidity to cut out UV. So it's very important not to write off the reefs that we might consider to be somewhat compromised or even marginal. Uh, these may also have some of the most important genotypes that may end up serving um, the recovery of reefs into the future. And that the thermally driven mortality has clearly surpassed local factors and is getting worse. Um, when we started looking at the impacts of climate change several decades ago, these were pretty localized events, and now they've turned to the regional level um, beyond anything we've ever seen before. Next slide. In terms of the multiple stressors, uh, very well put together by Andrea Gortoli and some of her colleagues, um, that uh, as we pointed out, uh, the role of heterotrophy um, having uh, organisms, corals, in fact, can feed not only through photosynthesis through their zooxanthellae, um, but in fact that we do see that uh, many of them can survive periods of time of turbidity if they still have enough uh, food that they can feed on heterotrophically. Um, the natural gradients for fugia and adaptive responses have already been ongoing, so that we need to take a look holistically uh, in the placement of MPAs and in the kinds of mitigation and opportunities we put together with the omics, the genomics, proteomics, and transcriptomics, we have tools that enable us to answer questions we could never approach before. And in other things that we've seen in life that bacteria actually may be running far more of the show than we ever um, understood in the beginning, uh, not only in terms of maybe being uh, behind some of the diseases, but it may turn out that the microbiome, the micro, uh, microbes, everything from the fungi and the bacteria uh, to the zooxanthellae are some of the most important links to understand the ability of coral reefs and particular populations to resist. And then finally, uh, warming doesn't happen in isolation, that there's synergisms between other anthropogenic stressors. Uh, coral reefs have evolved over time to be able to withstand certain uh, acute disturbances, uh, everything from hurricanes and typhoons to uh, lava flows in Hawaii. But it's this combination of uh, chronic anthropogenic stressors with these acute events that are now becoming more long-lasting at climate change level, they're really changing things up and changing the way we need to look at mitigation and response. Next slide, please. So in terms of watershed work, uh, Katharina Fabricia, Celia Smith did wonderful presentations on the drivers of uh, some of the problems we see. Uh, nutrients are a major issue. We've seen this in Maui with the injection wells. Uh, we see this from other sources of land-based sources of pollution. Uh, everything from sediment carrying uh, pesticides into the water uh, to fertilizers and others. So that um, in the last Quarry Symposium, the 2012, uh, there was a call to action that identified the importance of addressing climate change with one of the first actions to be done is to try to address local stressors now that are under more local control to be able to buy time to be able to get it together on the global level for climate change. Next slide, please. Um, that uh, it shows that grazers, while in many reefs, aren't actually important and may be uh, the, one of the reasons why reefs do not act. Um, there's also been other reefs that have found where the grazers may not have such an important role, so that it's a combination of both top-down and bottom-up control. Top-down meaning the grazers that may be able to keep algae in check, the lawnmowers of the reef, uh, but also other things are going on within the coral physiology um, that affect whether or not reefs either survive or recover or not and the new abilities to improve uh, monitoring to go beyond simply identifying the stressors and start to be able to measure uh, the effectiveness of mitigation. Um, emerging pollutants that most people never even thought about what they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there are some statistics, and again, I don't mean to be sexist here, but the typical female may use between 12 and 17 personal care products during the course of a week. Uh, guys are a little bit less than that. It can be uh, 3 to 12 but everything from the sunscreens that we use to the uh, shampoos, um, the uh, um, microplastics that people are aware of, some of the um, uh, micro uh, uh, spheres that are used to, uh, for abrasive, uh, all kinds of things are getting into the water and many of these compounds are not only having uh, effects at sublethal levels such as affecting reproduction, uh, but some of them are also endocrine disruptors and are really shifting the ability of organisms to do the most fundamental means of recovery and that's reproduction and recruitment, 
and these are just becoming to uh, be better understood. The work that Craig Downs has done, um, uh, Cheryl Woodley and the group at uh, the Hollings Marine Laboratory, Seabird, which is an old facility, has really brought new attention to the need for understanding coastal water quality. And this is where we look again at individuals. We know a little bit about carbon footprints. Uh, each one of us has a personal footprint. We can cut down on our carbon footprint a number of ways by being a little bit wiser in the way we use energy. But a lot of people don't recognize that the personal care products that we use and the household chemicals can have a devastating effect on coastal water quality. And that's a better uh, opportunity for improved communication with the public. Next slide, please. New understanding of nutrients and the role of nitrogen in its various forms that can do everything from shift uh, reefs from coral dominated to algal dominated to basically supporting bacteria and other uh, microbes that may be responsible for tumors. And once again, this is something that NOAA has been very uh, big part of, um, certainly one of the well-funded programs from uh, C-Score um, and the Coral Reef Ecosystem Studies Program on Ridge to Reef understanding that the connectivity between land and sea, um, especially on islands, high islands, is so short um, that anything we do on land today ends up in the coastal area tomorrow. So that coastal water quality is a major driver and that the understanding that we can't disconnect uh, ridge to reef from the way it's been done sometimes within the federal system, both legally in terms of um, authority of different agencies to the recognition that uh, these connectivities um, can really be devastating and that if we do a better job on land, we can help reefs. So truly coral reef uh, conservation begins on land, um, especially in any uh, high island or area that has any topography with it. Next slide. And thank you, Bob, for that wonderful summary presentation. Uh, and thank you everybody for tuning in today. We have the wonderful challenge of summarizing over a thousand scientific presentations into 45 minutes. So it, there's a lot to cover here. We are, anyways, leaving some time at the end to get uh, an engaging Q&A with all of you. So I'm hoping you're saving the questions for the end there. I also wanted to thank you, Bob, for organizing a symposium that was action-oriented. There was a world of a difference from the last time I attended the symposium in the U.S. where uh, this time around there was a much broader representation of the science management around coral reef areas. A lot of the social issues, issues and partnerships were there present. And there was a lot more, there was a reason for uh, concern as you very well cover at the beginning of the presentation, but there were also a lot of presentations that were looking at how do we do how do we move forward? What do we do now? The prognosis for coral reefs um, is not excellent, as we know, but in ICRS, we heard a number of solutions that are being tested out in a number of places very, very actively that give some reason of hope. One of them, we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about reef restoration, which is basically how you go following here uh, clockwise from a reef that used to be uh, abundant and a functioning ecosystem that has been degraded through active intervention into something that somewhat resembles the original state. Um, and this is not a, an act, a, a very passive restoration, but very active hands-on work that now it's being done. So where we've come about here in the last four years, um, learning that we've moved away from proof of concept saying trying to uh, do recovery at a very, very small scale, at something that amounted to like um, aquarium hobbyist, just uh, taking a much more pragmatic approach, a much more methodological um, approach to all of that. We're learning how to cover a, a wider area of coral reefs. Yeah, we're learning also the importance that some of these efforts have for education and outreach components. Just about every effort that uh, has been done on restoration carries a component where the community is involved at some point on that. And here I should point out that the Caribbean is a lot farther um, ahead than the Pacific, so the Caribbean has been doing restoration for a while and we're just getting started doing that here in Hawaii. 
A lot of the work that is being done as part of these restoration efforts also serves as a backup for, as a seed bank, to, uh, so, so to speak, for endangered species, corals that are very rare in the wild, that we're beginning to basically back them up in additional areas. So the science of restoration has really evolved in the last decade, and we're able basically to answer, uh, re restore a much wider areas of uh, ecosystems. Now, where we're going with all of this in the next four years, let's say between this ICRS and the next one, uh, we need to improve the sexual reproduction to ensure that there's high, higher survival of the, rec the recruits. How to scale up a lot of these efforts we've proven as a uh, sort of proof of concept that you can indeed restore a fairly small amount of reef, but that will not save an ecosystem unless we learn how to scale up. So we're beginning to learn the efficiencies, get a higher diversity, not just emphasizing the ones that grow very fast, but the ones that also are slow growers that play a critical role in that ecosystem. We're asking the questions, how do you know when you've um, been successful? And you put the reef back in the water, but what, how does it do afterwards? So we're monitoring not just when you switch a reef and just put it in the water, but how does it do, how does it stand up to the insults that are coming in from the environment and from human activities? And how do we help reduce the stressors in here? And i am give you an example here in Hawaii, we're beginning to set up a proof of concept coral, in situ coral nursery, where we're getting a lot of donor fragments coming from boat anchor, um, and boats running into the reefs, boat groundings. And eventually, we're getting those corals of opportunities that are being used up and given a second chance. But eventually, we also want to get a handle on that primary stressors. So we have, at some point, less fragments available to us because there's less stressors coming up. So looking at it at a more holistic point of view. So we are learning the main points of a takeaway from ICRS in terms of coral reef restoration is that the process is now scientifically based. We know what to look at. We know how the questions. We are getting better at understanding which questions we need to be looking at and how it complements conservation. Again, restoration by itself, it doesn't do any good to restore a reef if the original stressors stay there or are not addressed. So how is restoration a complement to active conservation efforts that are taking place? Uh, and I'll give the example again in Kaneohe Bay here in Hawaii, the area where the reefs are being restored are actively managed. You have invasive algae seaweed that is being removed on a regular basis. You have sea urchins that are being introduced, native sea urchins that are being planted, so to speak, back into the ecosystem so you can get a control of, of that invasive algae and give corals a chance. We're learning a lot more on new technologies. Um, the, we, uh, one of the very exciting elements here is the term microfragmentation, where you get a very, very small amount of polyps. We're talking two to three polyps each and then watch them reproduce. And we have learned that they can basically double in size within a week at rates that are 25 to 50 times faster than what occurs in the wild. So in the past, you've been getting fragments that are finger size, and you put them in, in, in small pieces and monitor that over time. Now we're say, seeing that when you get very, very small fragments, again, two to three polyps uh, a piece, they go into a survival mode and they start expanding much faster. And the potential seems to be there that we may be able to achieve 20 years worth of growth within a single year. So there's a lot that is being tested out at the moment, some of it very, very promising. Now, let's switch topic to a major, another major element of ICRS, which was coral reef fish and fisheries. And lo and behold, we're learning that fish need healthy reefs and reefs need healthy fish and allow me for a moment here to do a little bit of self-promotion and I want to show you now our coral logo in here. Um, very proud of this logo because it captures basically the interactions between the ecosystem. 
most of you probably are seeing a, co um, a coral, uh, coral fragments in there, um, a branching coral perhaps. You're looking at a white space. But if you look at the blue space, you can see some fish. So maybe at the bottom, somewhere near the bottom, something that resembles a shark. You look a little lower maybe, or all the way up, maybe that's a moray eel, and all sorts of fish in between, playing with a negative space. So what would be a coral that is spawning on the white space, you see a fish there. And what I like to say is that what happens when you take the coral away, you just have an empty blue space, the fish disappear. What happens when you take out all the fish, when you just take all the blue away, you just have a white empty space and the coral disappears. And that's actually what we're finding out um, the more we look at the issue, that interconnectivity between the reefs and the corals. And we're getting a much better understanding into how that connectivity goes. We're also uh, understanding how, and I'll give you one more example that has come up uh, in the science recently, is that the role of sound um, for guiding where the re uh, uh, coral reef, a very young coral reef larvae settles. And this is nothing but amazing. We're talking about an, a marine organism that lacks a central nervous system but we're learning that the larva can follow the sounds of a healthy reef because a healthy reef has a lot of sounds and munching and crunching going on and the biggest and most important decision in your life if you're a small little coral larvae trying to find out uh, where you're going to be living the rest of your life is where to settle and they've evolved to follow the sounds of a healthy reef. So again, going back to that issue, if you take all the fish away, the sounds disappear or are muted. And then the larvae doesn't have as many environmental cues as to where to settle. So that has been sort of a stunning discovery that has come up recently. We're learning that even the areas that we think are species that are primarily reef species are basically dependent on nearby ecosystem, mangroves and sea grasses as well as nurseries. So the wholeness of the ecosystem is expanding. And also the role of the big old fat fertile female fish, buffs, are we're getting better and better understanding of how critical it is, they are for maintaining the stock of species. Uh, for the most part, when you do fishery regulations, you select a minimum size where below that size fish cannot get caught, but above that size anything is fair game. And actually we organize entire fishing tournaments trying to catch the biggest fish. That seems to be extremely counterproductive when we're taking out the biggest fish because they are orders of magnitudes more efficient at getting um, uh, eggs and basically recruiting the next generation. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, 27 inch bluefin trevally here yes, species in Hawaii is 87 times more fertile and releases 87 times more eggs than a 12 inch species, um, specimen. So 87 times a single species that is just maybe three times as large can be can have the worth of 87 times as many eggs as there. So maybe we're looking at the issue of doing slot limits basically where you set up a minimum limit for a fisheries where you wait until they become fertile and then upper limit so you also have those older females represented and active within there or uh, having the setup of an MPA to preserve them. Uh, we're learning that reef fishers cannot sustain efforts uh, for uh, exporting so they can s they're sufficient to support a local the local community and I would say here this is true also for aquarium fish collecting uh, as well as for food but coral reef fishes do not make a very good um, export material. The fishing on coral reefs is widespread and I'm sure I'm not bringing any breaking news here but again we're understanding with the value of those large specimens, the large females in the ecosystem overfishing takes even a more urgent um, uh, of a threat that needs to be addressed. and uh, We're learning the holistic approach that is needed uh, to 
be able to manage these ecosystems. We have been developing ecosystem approaches to fishery management, moving away slowly and gradually, moving away from single species management plans to one that takes into account the local, the, or the entire ecosystem, uh, however that is defined, along with the blending of the traditional ecological knowledge and cutting edge science uh, as well. So we're getting better at understanding how you need to draft the, those management plans, who needs to be involved, what you need to, to be paying attention and respect to for that to succeed. Going forward, there's a lot of stuff that is happening, uh, especially we're learning how to do a lot with very little. They, uh, how to do management when you have data poor conditions. And that's something, an area that has been actively an area of training in the international community doing fish stock assessments in data poor conditions. So instead of needing a million dollars worth of man uh, monitoring efforts, to get the science to the level that it needs to fit into management plans, we're able to approximate that with a fraction of the cost. We're also getting learning that the that a management plan cannot basically be static; it needs to be very adaptive. Because the future is not like the past, uh, the past is not uh, the present is not even like the past. So we need to understand to manage a world we don't fully understand, and we need to give ourselves that flexibility for that. The uh, moving forward, we have a lot of exciting technologies coming uh, online for us. One of them being uh, the genetic approaches to do what it's called eDNA or environmental DNA. Thus, when you take a sample of the environment, in this case, it would be the water column, and then you basically analyze it to find what. Um, the species that are present based on the water samples. You're looking at the excretions and the cells that are found there, and you can get a better representation of what makes a reef. There are many species that are notoriously hard to find. and uh, The new technology is giving us that ability to monitor what's normally not seen. Uh, and potentially, this is a very nascent technology, it's just coming up online, but potentially it can give us a much broader picture of the richness of the ecosystem we're trying to manage. We're also getting better at um, realizing the need to understand better the mesophotic reefs and how the connection that it has with the other reefs. Keeping on the theme of what's ahead uh, in remote sensing and emerging th uh, tools, I mentioned eDNA, again, an area that is going to be very exciting in the coming years. We're learning to use satellites better. Coral Reef Watch has been producing better and better products. In fact, they've recently transitioned from 50 kilometer uh, data products to five kilometer data products and are able to also from the satellite to monitor uh, much, much, uh, with much higher accuracy, currents, weather, turbidity. Uh, and temperature. Uh, again, also Coral Reef Watch is able to look in farther out into the future and are getting testing out seasonal outlooks for coral bleaching. So not just telling you how likely you are to have your coral ble uh, coral bleaching next mo next year next um, week, but also in the next three months. We are also getting much um, better satellite tags that are telling us how. Uh, how the organisms are migrating, and we're actually putting that into the NOAA Science on the Sea, where you're able to get a global view of how far the organisms are going, and the battery life is getting much better on the systems and the transmission as well. We're also learning, again, to listen to the ecosystem. There are approaches that are trying to um, use sound as a proxy for reef health and diversity in there. The autonomous vehicles, extremely exciting stuff. Probably there's many people in the audience that have a remote control vehicle that flies in the air, a drone, and those are being put in the service of science and getting tremendous amount of information in there um, as well as the optical technology that are, is able to fly uh, over reef areas and get a much better sense of how the reefs are doing. So it is very exciting where we're moving for um, with the new technology. And uh, with the MPA, we're learning a better sense of basically how to design an MPA that helps the marine ecosystem you're trying to manage. We're getting a better, a more realistic at how long it takes for an MPA to take effect, so we make promises that are better kept 
uh, in the past maybe the concept of setting aside an area was um, achieved by prom over promising what it can do and now we're learning and doing a reality check and learning that actually this, uh, these do work but need to be given uh, a lot more time and looking at specific species that are, um, that are uh, you're trying to target as well. Here, uh, the ending slide here for fishery and MPA management, uh, you need both. So basically fishery management is necessary, but not sufficient. You know, with, the, with fishery management, you can allocate the catch among the users and regulate the fishing gear and the sizes and limit the fishing effort that is happening. Uh, it get, give, allows you to give a fair allocation of the resources, but you also need not take MPAs that eliminate the bycatch that is taken, uh, eliminate the uh, lessens the effect that their fishing gear has on the ecosystem and minimizes the damage to ecosystem. They also help um, quantify the no, uh, or respect the non-extractive uses that are taking place uh, around the reef area, recreation, science, and so-called insurance areas. So the take home, the uh, MPAs can pro, um, provide place-based management that helps whatever else is happening as well in conjunction with a lot of fishery management. And I'm going to pick up again the theme of technology and what lies ahead. And this is something that has been in the news for a little bit, at least uh, in the coral news world, which is the work being done at HMB by the current IC, um, uh, International Society of Reef Studies direct, uh, President Ruth Gates, which is a concept of assisting evolution. And what he's looking at is doing, uh, very realistically looking at the current environmental changes are outpacing the ability for corals to adapt. In the past, when you had sea level rise, and corals were able to keep up with that, and maybe that's not the case anymore. Uh, when Bob mentioned that the prognosis for coral bleaching is not the rosiest, or that we can be expecting a future where corals may be bleaching every three years or more often, how do you do then? So the idea is looking at the ecosystems and how they themselves are responding. There's selectivity already in place in nature because not all reefs respond the same way to a bleaching event. And you can see here in the photo, a coral, bleach, a coral that has bleached next to one that seems to be doing fine. So the response is highly variable, even across very large scales or within a single reef. The concept of assisted evolution is you, you capitalize on this variation and you pay attention to high performance uh, reefs. You look at the ones that haven't bleached that what you look bright, uh, you could call them bright spots, the ones that should have been dead but are not. Why? And then what do you do? You pr uh, put the emphasis on the survivors and accelerate the naturally occurring evolution process to enhance tolerance to uh, thermal stress. You slowly acclimatize the reef to what might call the, uh, the future conditions. You do selective breeding and you modify the relationship between the partners and the symbionts. So again, you're sort of doing natural evolution at a, at a, on asteroids at a higher pace and hoping that you are able to get reefs that are better capable to uh, deal with a world that is coming up. You're working with the biology. You're building the biological capacity to enhance the existing interventions. So through this approach, there's a possibility to increase the resilience and uh, restore reefs. Um, again, this is very much a proof of concept. And there's major questions about scalability. And as um, Bob mentioned earlier, selecting at the cost of what? This higher resistance to thermal stress might come at the cost of something else that we might not know. So it's something that uh, should be looked at uh, with a curve fly along with a number of other management options. And with that, Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you for the main take-home messages uh, to tell us a little bit about the side meetings that took place that are essential uh, function of these um, ICRS meetings and a little bit about the Leader Summit. Back to you, Bob. Thanks so much, Paolo. So great job in summarizing that. So if we go to the next slide, um, we pretty much covered uh, the main issues there, and I think one of the main take-home points was that as a community of practitioners, of uh, natural scientists, social scientists, 
uh, practitioners that deal with education, outreach, policy. Um, the message is very clear. The reefs are in trouble and they're threatened, but they're not doomed. And there still is a window of opportunity to turn things around. Uh, climate change issues are very, very clear, as are the local stressors, and we need to address all of them. Uh, some are low-hanging fruit, others are going to take more time, but uh, we can't uh, feel very good about fixing all the local stressors and eventually have something succumb to the uh, overall uh, impacts of climate change. Um, and that's a very important part of messaging, and the good news is that people get it, and I was very pleased to see that balance throughout the meeting of um, urgency but optimism as well. Next slide, please. Um, well, I was really pleased to see that this is no longer a quote-unquote purely scientific meeting, but it's trying to make science that matters. And again, I'd like to um, truly thank uh, the folks at C-Score uh, within uh, NOAA and the Cordy Ecosystem Studies for always pushing us to try to look at the so what part of it. Um, we have better tools than ever before. We have better knowledge than ever before. And what we really need to do now is work on the uh, translation of this information to action and into political will. Um, there's quite a lot of good information out there, and I don't have to tell people in NOAA you deal with this every day. Um, this is how we can do a better job of communicating the urgency uh, without uh, giving that despair, and to be able to work effectively with uh, policymakers, including members of Congress, um, to get beyond the um, uh, problems with these uh, ideologies and get onto reality. Next slide. Um, as part of this, we were very fortunate to be able to pull together what we're calling a leader summit to really try to go beyond what we're talking about into the action mode and to really focus on the bridging of science to policy. And again, I'll um, uh, like to acknowledge uh, Felix Martinez and Rob Magnian and Mike DeGallo, who recently retired, of pushing us to be able to develop these relationships with leaders and communities in the Pacific. Um, the three presidents that I mentioned earlier, including President Mengus out from Palau, uh, who was recognized by the United Nations as a world hero. And I was thrilled to see we had very good support from NOAA, um, Assistant Administrator Eileen Sobek um, from NIMS. We also had Assistant Secretary Esther Kia Aina from Department of Interior Office of Insular Affairs. Um, it was a really great meeting of minds of not just scientists, but we had lawyers there, we had social scientists uh, that were involved, Dr. Uh, Josh Sinner, um, Jack Kittinger. We had the Chief Justice from the uh, uh, Federated States of Micronesia Supreme Court who gave us a really cool overview of the kinds of struggles that he has. And it was this really nice meeting of minds that came together to really determine, you know, we can do much better. And what the leaders were really asking for is they're willing to take a leadership role internationally. Um, we had um, three uh, votes at the United Nations sitting in the room. Uh, they went back to a small island developing states meeting in Palau and they work with the Pacific Island Forum. So there are 16 sovereign nations that are all signing on to this uh, relationship of trying to work harder between the science and policymakers. What the policymakers clearly understood and made a very good statement. Um, it's uh, on the website. You can see the entire formal statement. And many of the things that we've talked about, uh, we have the um, uh, plenary talks, including President Remengasau's opening, which was uh, phenomenal. Uh, all of this is up on the ICRS website, so all you have to do is Google 13 ICRS and you can get there. But it was a very strong recognition that these guys are willing to take the leadership role, uh, but they're looking to the scientific community to back them. They don't want to be hung out to dry to be able to make strong statements on everything from local stressors, land-based source of pollution, MPAs, to climate change if they don't have the scientific community and the management community um, to uh, back them up. And so uh, one of the things that we worked on was kind of a gap analysis and moving forward. Um, some of the problems they have, this is really a call out to those of you that work more on the policy side and legal side. Um, the Minister of Resources for Palau <laughs> gave a really good example of having to use an illegal grading permit law to deal with a ship grounding. They had no way of dealing with a ship that ran aground and devastated a reef. So what they were finally able to get them on was that they were illegally clearing and grading without a permit. And if you want to talk about creativity, um, it was kind of a, uh, a tribute to the ability to try to find ways to make things work. But we've got to do a lot better in not only bridging science to policy, but bringing the law and the legal uh, policy framework in such a way that the knowledge we have can be more effectively used. Next slide. 
Um, so the call to action, I won't go through it. I'll just uh, ask you to go and look at the website, but it was a clear recognition and a clear request from the leaders for more partnerships. Next slide. And the response was a very strong one from the representatives of the, when I say scientific community, it was much more than that. It was the technical community, including lawyers, policymakers, social scientists, educators, to indicate that there were um, basically seven areas that were identified as immediate needs. And now what we're trying to do is move forward in providing the financial, human, and institutional resources. Frankly, a lot of the stuff is out there. Uh, we just haven't done a good job of putting it into a form and a format that's easily accessible. Um, but we do have a, a clear mandate from the leaders and a clear response from the uh, supporting community of practitioners that gives me, again, a lot of optimism that we can and will do a lot better in the future. Next slide. So by ending that this was really a, 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 an entire village to, to make this work, many, many people helped not only in the Cliff Notes version, but throughout the uh, symposium. And again, I want to recognize Noah as being an incredibly important partner uh, in all levels, from the human resources that went into this, uh, the intellectual uh, power that was provided by Noah, the financial support as well. And uh, leave it over to um, you guys now if there are any questions or anything that Paolo and I can uh, answer in the short term. And encourage people to please contact me offline if there's anything that I've said that uh, I could embellish on. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you both. That was terrific. And, and there's no small challenge to s summarize the intensity of what I'm sure was an incredible week-long series of meetings and presentations into what you've just uh, given us this this high-level summary, which is just terrific. And I, I do want to tell people that the recording of this webinar will be available in open channels and the slides will be available on the MPA Center website. So you will have this as a reference. I know a couple of people have asked that question. Uh, and there was also a question about the URL for the call to action. Can you repeat that, Bob? Yeah, the easy way, it's uh, through what's called the Schneider Group, but just Google 13 ICRS and it'll immediately pop up to the um, website. And also you can do coralreef.org, which is the International Society for Reef Studies. Um, all of the um, uh, videos of the uh, plenary talks and all of these other documents will be on both sites. Great. Thank you. So. Um, couple of questions and I encourage uh, those of you on the line to go ahead and, and type your questions in if you do have questions. Uh, so there's one question uh, uh, referencing Dr. Knowlton's plenary and asking about how do we improve the coverage and diversity of species on coral reefs and their ecological roles? Sure, I'll have a, a cut at that. Um, you know, the whole idea is that when we look at diversity, we're so used to looking at species, but we can also look at trophic levels and um, when we talk about diversity, so much of it now we're understanding is really at the microbiome level. Um, the idea is to create a diversity of habitats that are healthy, and with the habitats uh, will come the diversity of organisms as well. Uh, one of the issues that Nancy touched upon, again, two things that I really um, appreciated that she talked about, was the understanding that diversity uh, is often at the um, genetic level within species and within populations, and that's something that it's only recent that we can start to track that. And that's when I mentioned this Irish potato famine effect. Everybody thought things were going great because they found this one genotype of potato that did really well under one set of circumstances. And then a particular pathogen, actually a fungus, came in and took everything out. So I think Nancy's message of uh, keeping an idea on diversity, uh, trophic levels, interactions, keystone species, the microbiome of the uh, small things, the fungi, the cyanobacteria, the regular bacteria, as well as the zooxanthellae is critically important to maintain diversity there. So maintaining a diversity of healthy habitats maintains the other diversity. And the other thing I really want to uh, acknowledge Nancy for was her continued ability to articulate that it's not over, that there are so many things we know now that we can do, including addressing these diversity issues at all levels. Thanks. So here's a question from Heidi Stiller asking, do you have ideas about how the science side can do better um, with making connections to the management and policy applications? And um, you mentioned, a, yeah, what, that's one example a great question. of that. That was the whole idea of trying to change around the theme. Um, you know, you can have the best idea in the world, but timing matters. And, um, you know, five, to ten years ago, this never would have flown. To see the scientific community embrace what was typically a science meeting, 
of, you know, as I like to tease people, uh, geeks and nerds talking to nerds and geeks. Um, it's gone way beyond that. So I think there's a full recognition uh, from the quote-unquote scientists, and when I say that, I mean with due respect to the social sciences, people with knowledge, including the traditional practitioners, those with traditional ecological knowledge, there's so much knowledge out there. What we have not done is a good job of moving that knowledge into the policy framework. And I've learned from working with Jerry Davis and my other NOAA counterparts that the only tool a manager really has is his or her regulatory authority that's set up by legislation. So if you have overarching legislation that empowers an agency or a group um, to have the ability to then do things, um, the value of science is at the regulatory level where through an administrative process you can come in almost monthly now, but certainly biannually or annually to come up with, well, here's a better threshold for sediment. Here's a better threshold for water quality. Here's a better threshold for um, trying to control uh, pesticides and things of this nature. The science is moving so quickly that we can update the regulations, and you can do that through administrative process. The problem we've done in moving the science to policy is huge issues. In one of our papers that we did under the C-Score grant, we did a review of 17 pieces of federal legislation going back to the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899 that enables the Army Corps of Engineers to make amazing decisions on natural resources predicated on the fact that in 1899 the main issue for coral reefs was they were hazards to navigation. Certainly we can do far better than that. We've been working on the reauthorization of the Coral Reef Conservation Act for the last 14 years with no progress whatsoever. So the big issue now is the science and the knowledge are not the limiting process or uh, issue in my view. It's being able to put these into a form and a format that can be more user friendly and developing not only sound legislation but updating regulations that go beyond you need to put up a sediment screen to really addressing the issue of you need to be able to protect water quality. And here's another question from Charles Wiggins, uh, again referencing the science policy issues and asking, were there, um, do you have ideas about creative policy levers that exist domestically in the U.S. to hold us accountable for climate change impacts to coral reefs that are affecting our neighbors around the globe? You know, it's a huge issue and, um, you know, some of you may be familiar with the idea with the uh, Endangered Species Act that that was recently put on NOAA. Um, due to uh, the Center for Biological Diversity filing suit. And one of the justifications was maybe the uh, ESA could be used as a leverage on climate change. Um, I, the jury is out. Um, I had my doubts, and I still do. Um, it seems to be a tool, you know, yeah, you can hammer and nail with a wrench, and I've done it, but wouldn't it be much better to have a hammer? Uh, we really need to deal with the issue of uh, getting policies in that are directly related to the issue at hand. Um, you know, you can treat diseases a number of ways, but having the, the most focused uh, way of approaching it, and it really is a disease. Climate change is an illness that's hitting the earth that we need to respond to, and because I'm not within federal government and I'm within academia, I say the electorate is where we really need to focus to get beyond false ideologies, and there were 18 um, U.S.-based uh, scientific organizations that just wrote a very strong letter to uh, U.S. Congress pointing out that this is no longer a debate, um, that this is well known, and if Congress is not willing to come up and address this issue, then we're not going to be able to do any better. And part of it is just communicating, uh, communicating with stakeholders. The insurance industry is there. The military is there. Uh, everybody understands climate change, but there's an ideology that's being pu pushed on uh, the world right now that's clearly false. Um, we actually called out one of the interesting letters you'll see on the website was a letter signed by myself as the convener and past president of the Corey Society and Ruth Gates as the president, calling out uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, the prime minister of Australia, who just eked out maybe a win that they just approved a 60-year permit on what will be the world's largest coal mine. At a time, literally, it's bringing gasoline to a house fire. Um, the Great Barrier Reef has never seen such devastating damage before, and we know that it's all generated by greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel as the major driver. So we need to be able to do a better job in messaging and getting the electorate on board, not only within the U.S., but internationally, so that people will look at what this means not only for today, and recognizing when we talk about coral reefs, this is not a coral reef issue. Uh, $9.9 .9 trillion in economic value worldwide for 500 million people. But whatever we do to address climate change at the policy level is not only good for coral reefs, but it's great for all of humanity. And we need to focus that this is a people issue, not just a coral reef issue. Very true. And, and I would just 
add that there's a lot of great research that's going on around climate change communication, and I encourage folks who are interested in it to take a look at what's available out there on the web by some great organizations. Um, finally, the last word, quickly, uh, has any thought been given to hosting ICRS every two years? Seems <laughs> like, given how rapidly the technology and the issues are evolving, that there might be a need for more interaction and momentum. You know, there's been a lot of discussion, and you know, in my previous role as president of the society, um, the whole focus of this meeting was to follow up on something, actually a great uh, uh, document that you can get from the Rockefeller Foundation website, Meetings That Matter. We really wanted this to be a meeting that mattered to get beyond just scientists talking to scientists and look at science to policy, knowledge to action. Um, there's been a couple of discussions. It's gotten to be so much bigger. When I did my first meeting in 1977, there were 250 of us that could fit into a single bar. Uh, now it's 2,500, so the venues are you know limiting. Um, there's been some call. Uh, many of you may know that there's a management directed meeting called ITMEMS. That's every other uh, two years. So the Cordy Symposium. Uh, there'll be an ITMEMS meeting in two years from now, which is management oriented. Some people approach me to just discuss. You know, it's getting so big. Why don't we separate out the managers from the natural and physical scientists? And I said, you know that's going in the wrong direction. So I think there is an understanding that this wasn't meant to be a one-off meeting where we'll you know, tread water until uh, four years from now. What we're really looking at, and a lot of us are engaged in, and we know NOAA will hopefully be involved in every step of the way, we're looking to NOAA and to others of how do we keep the momentum going, how do we take the um, marching orders, the blueprint, and the timeline, which we've established uh, from a number of these sessions, and start working to the implementation. So we're really focused on the action. Some of it will take uh, financial resources. So we've already reached out to uh, people within NOAA, within the Department of Interior. Uh, we also have some private foundations that have stepped up that are really keen on this knowledge to action piece. And so what we're really looking for is, you know, going beyond the meetings, that there's an awful lot we can do. So in answer to the question, there are discussions about having more regional meetings, maybe a little bit more targeted between now and then, and there's a lot of interest in that as well. But um, I think the idea now is that we already have a lot uh, on, on our plate to move forward on, and I think the focus should be on what we've already come out from, from this last meeting a couple of weeks ago to start on the implementation phase. All right, well, we will leave it there. Thank you very much to both of you, um, Bob and Paolo, and I really appreciate you being with us today. And if anyone who wants to hear uh, the high points again or pass them on to a colleague, uh, they will be posted on open channels, and the slides will be posted on the MPA Center website. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye.